Hello, and welcome to the very first episode of the Girls Talk Money podcast. My name is Erin. And I'm Grace. In today's episode, we are going to be talking all about finding balance with your money. Um, I feel like we have a million different things that we can talk about with regard to this episode topic. This episode topic came about because Grace and I were talking about this for our own financial situations the other day for like over an hour, and we were like, this needs to be a podcast episode. So here we are. Before we get into it, let's recap on our week. A big reason why Grace and I wanted to start a podcast together is because we don't live in the same city. I'm in Pittsburgh, she's in Boston, and um, we really just wanted an opportunity to kind of like touch base with each other once a week. Grace, what is going on in your week? Well, I I mean, listeners probably don't know, but I am a full-time freelancer. I work for myself 100% of the time, and next week, well, next week when we're filming this, Erin and I are headed to FinCon, which is a financial conference, and that means I'm going to be out of office for the whole week, which means that any client work I need to do next week, I have to do this week. So it's been a little bit hectic and busy just trying to get through as much client work as possible, prepping for the conference and, you know, getting myself ready. But it's it's good, right? Being busy and productive is a good problem to have. Prepping for FinCon, I feel like has been a lot just because um, we are also planning on doing a lot of podcast stuff when we're there. Grace and I are kind of like taking the opportunity in like being in the same city for once to like batch record a bunch of episodes. So we're going to see how we do with that. Like right now we're obviously filming virtually um, when we're at FinCon in person. It's in New Orleans. We're going to kind of like take the opportunity to like film in person for a couple of episodes, which will be good to kind of like test out both formats. But um, I'm really excited. There's a lot of work that goes into like going to these types of things um, and it'll probably be killing our social battery by the end of it, but we're really excited. But with that, I guess we should get into the show. Like we said at the beginning, this episode is going to be all about finding balance with your money. Um, I feel like there are so many different ways that we can take this conversation. We get so many questions on how do you balance wanting to hit your financial goals and also like wanting to just live your life in your 20s? We get a ton of questions about like the whole saving versus investing versus debt pay down debate. So there are a ton of different things we want to talk about today. Let's start. Where do you want to start? I can talk a little bit about like my, where I was kind of coming from on this conversation, but the conversation between Erin and I started when we were talking about, you know, especially in the personal finance space online, if you're involved in that, if you follow personal finance creators, if you're, you know, there's a lot of great personal finance Facebook groups or books or things like that. There's so much pressure to go absolutely like balls to the walls with your financial goals and to just put every single extra dollar you have into it. But we also want to like live our lives. And so Erin and I had kind of talked about it. We're like, well, we, we both recently, well, in the past year or so, we've both changed the structure of our business which gives us like a little bit more wiggle room to do things with the money that we make. And, you know, then this question arises of like, well, what do we do with that money? Do we invest a lot more of it? Or do we take that as an opportunity to be like, okay, I've worked really hard to grow this business. I'm going to enjoy my life. And I think I've kind of gone back and forth. I don't know how long this has been like a struggle for you, but I've gone back and forth on this whole, how do I balance all my financial goals things for years? I remember I graduated college in 2021 and I really, really wanted to travel for like a year straight. And I was going to hop from Airbnb to Airbnb every month. And I was so conflicted because I was like, okay, I'm living, I was living at my parents' house, which I still am two and a half years later. And, you know, I didn't have rent. And so that gave me more wiggle room in my budget. And I thought, well, I also have student loan debt. I want to pay off and I want to be smart about that, but I want to travel and I want to use my money to actually live my life. But I was so conflicted about, okay, well, I can't, how can I possibly do both? And I actually posted in a Facebook group. I think it's called like women in personal finance or something or women, women on fire. Cause fire stands for financial independence, retire early. And it's just a community of a bunch of women that are interested in personal finance and, you know, living a financially responsible life. And I, I asked in the group, I was like, look, I want to travel, but I also have debt and I want to be smart about it. What do I do? And, you know, there were a lot of people who were commenting and, and they were like, well, you know, I would focus on the debt or go live your life and travel. And there were a few people that commented and they were like, why not do both? Like, why not split, you know, put some money towards your travel savings and some money towards your debt so that you can, you know, still get to your financial goals, maybe a little slower than if you put everything towards your financial goals, but then you can actually live your life. And I think that was the initial moment for me that I was like, wait, 
I can actually do both at the same time and it's going to be okay. So I've constantly had these conversations, like coming back to myself and being like, okay, you know, I have all these different financial goals. How do I balance them? How do I create a strategy that feels comfortable for me? I think that goes back to like the why you want to increase your income to begin with. Um, I get so many comments on my videos on social media that are like, lifestyle creep is hitting you so hard and i have just made a video about this the other day that performed like pretty well because i think a lot of people relate to this you are literally allowed to want to increase your income for the sole purpose of like affording things that you couldn't afford before that like do improve your quality of life today whether that be experiences with your friends or like a nicer apartment i said in the video before i increased my income i couldn't afford to live without roommates and like living without roommates has literally been the best game changer for my mental health, my business, everything this year. So you are allowed to increase your expenses as you increase your income. It doesn't have to be, oh, I'm going to increase my income just so I can max out my 401k this year. And just so I can do like X, Y, and Z financial things that are going to improve my life 30 years from now. I think there's this in what I had to do. <clears throat> what I found most helpful was I had to come back to like, what do I want my life to actually look like? And, you know, there's a lot of people, again, especially in the personal finance space where they're living super frugally, you know, they're living with a ton of roommates, they drive an old beat up car, they, you know, they don't eat out with their friends much, and that makes them happy. That's what fuels them. They enjoy that frugal lifestyle. And I had to be honest with myself and be like, I don't enjoy that frugal lifestyle. Like, I don't want to be eating rice and beans every day if I don't have to. I don't want to drive my car until it literally doesn't pass inspection solely for the, the purpose I don't want to, you know, buy another one. I want to enjoy that. I like getting, you know, my Botox on. I like getting my hair colored. I like traveling. And if you're, if you're trying to just reach financial goals, like just for this, you know, you're increasing your income, like you said, just to invest more because somebody else is doing it, or you are, you know, trying so hard to pay off your debt solely because you think it would look like a flex to be like, oh, I paid it off this fast, which was actually the boat that I was in. You know, you're not really, it's not authentic to you. It's going to get frustrated because it's not going to be, I don't know, you're not reaching the goal for a reason that feels fulfilling to you. You're reaching it because you feel obligated to. One topic that I had here that I wanted us to touch on was like what it even means to create financial goals, how to do so effectively, because I think like what you just said is so applicable here. What are you working towards? I think for so long, and we're all guilty of this. I know I'm really bad at this and it, it's hard. Like when you're so young, like mapping out your financial goals, I think it's important for people to remember that your financial goals should be a direct result of your life goals, not the other way around. I think for so many people you see, I mean, I'm even guilty about this. Like I was doing the series on social media for the last year that was like, growing my net worth to 100k and everyone gets so fixated on that number but my life didn't change when I hit a 100k net worth nothing about that number made a difference in my life so then I get questions now that are like well what's your net worth goal now or what do you want your like investment portfolio to grow things like that those numbers are super arbitrary and like don't really matter that much what you do need to do is set a life goal whether that be you want to in five years take a year off and travel or in five years you want to buy a house or you want to retire your parents buy a lake house like any big life goal that will like actually improve your quality of life and then kind of like back yourself into that number because money can only really help you get there i like that idea of working backwards because like you said i feel like a lot of people think once i make this much or once i have this much saved or whatever my life's going to be so different but if you're pulling that number from somebody else, this is what I did with an emergency savings. I'd be like, oh, well, I see somebody else's emergency savings is this much. So when I get to that amount, it's going to make me feel good. I think it was like five or 8,000 and I saved that much. And then I was like, wait, I work for myself. My income is inconsistent. That doesn't give me the amount of security I need. So I decided to save more because that's what I personally needed. And I feel like if you're basing some of those milestones, those numbers on some what someone else is doing, you're going to get to that point. You're going to be like, well, this really isn't, this isn't helping me. So it's like working backwards of being same thing. Like you said, okay, I know I want to take a year off and travel. How much do I need to have saved to be able to afford that? Okay. Well, I like to travel on a budget. So I know that I only need to save $50,000. If I was taking a year off and traveling, $50,000 ain't going to get me very far. Because if I'm traveling for a whole year, 
I'm not, I don't want to be staying in hostels for 12 months, you know, like I'd want to have more. So, you know, you have to think about what those numbers, like what's the why behind those numbers and what's the why behind the goals that you have? Because if you're working towards them because you see somebody else doing them or because you feel like that's some arbitrary number that makes sense, you're going to get to that goal and you're going to be sorely disappointed. You're going to wish you maybe had done it differently. If you don't set that goal, it can be really hard to stay motivated to like continue working towards it because you don't really have an end goal mm -hmm. in sight. Like for example, earlier this week, I saw this, I think it was a reel on Instagram or something um, that was like, my partner and I are each investing $50 a week because in 10 years we want to have $75,000 saved up to take a year off and travel $50 a week invested is like what's going to get us there and they like have the calculation in the reel or whatever save the video because I was like I just love that like okay two people sitting down that are like we know in 10 years like this is a really big life goal of ours what's the number that we need to get there and then like let's break that down into small increments what number that we can invest today is going to like help us reach that goal and they're probably really motivated to invest that $50 a week now because they know in 10 years they're going to take like a really awesome trip it reminds me this conversation just reminds me a lot of I don't know if you've seen these on social media I feel like you probably have but I see so many videos talking about you know helping people save their first a hundred thousand dollars or you know make their first 100k I see 100k being this I don't know, this like marker all the time, especially when it comes to saving. And I'm like, why are we saving $100,000? What is it for? Like, if you have $100,000 just sitting in a high yield savings account, please, for the love of God, move some, like, like, go live your life, spend it, invest some of it, like do something with that money. I mean, if, again, if you're saving for a house or something like that, okay, yeah, it makes sense to have a big chunk of cash <laughs> sitting in your savings account for that down payment. But I see a lot of people talking about saving your first 100,000 and I'm like, what, what's the reason? I can be like, well, I saved $100,000. It's like, okay, great. Other people <laughs> took that 100K in small increments while you were saving and they went and lived their life. So if you want to have 100K saved, that's awesome. But if you're going to look back and be like, dang, I wish I didn't hoard that 100K just so I could flex and say I saved it. I wish I did something with it instead, invested it bought a new car, went and traveled with my friends, enjoyed my life in my 20s and had more balance. Well, then like, why are you saving 100K? Like, why are you stashing it in a high yield savings account for what, you know? It's like an arbitrary number that I think gets thrown around so much in the personal finance space online. Yeah, I feel like I have matured a lot in this topic since I started on social media two years ago versus like where I am now. Because I think like when I first started, obviously I was 22, fresh out of college, I was working a corporate job that I didn't really love. It was just kind of like a job that I showed up to and didn't have any attachment to. So in my head, I'm like, okay, I'm going to invest like as much as possible in my twenties so that I can reach like the coast fi number and like <laughs> never have to invest for retirement again. Now here we are two years later, you and I are both self-employed. We both do things that we really love. I feel like making money is kind of like our hobby at this point. Yeah, I never honestly. see myself completely walking away from work. I only see myself growing from here and with that growing my income from here so this is sort of where the conversation like led us last week when we were talking about this topic why are we motivated to absolutely max out every retirement account and every investment account and all of those things and not enjoy our money today because at that point you're kind of like admitting that you either don't want to continue making this amount of money or you like don't think that you can sustain this amount of income we're like i don't think either of that is true for us because we're very hard hard workers we enjoy what we do we love what we do and like we only really see our career trajectory going up from here that was one of the things too that always came up for me because i was so afraid to invest so i don't think i actually started investing until i was 22 it was right after i graduated college i think and at the time, I was just trying to learn as much as I could, and I was absorbing as much content as I would see online. And, you know, you see all this content of, okay, figure out how much you want to retire with, and then, you know, work yourself backwards to figure out how much you need to contribute. And I've been working for myself since I graduated college, so I don't have, like, an employer 401k match, so I do have to contribute a little bit more of my own money, which I knew from the get-go. But I realized, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to throw all this extra money into retirement, you know, I was seeing all these people who wanted, were like, I want to retire in my 30s, whatever. And I was like, yeah, like, that's so cool. Let's do it. And then I started thinking about the reality of it. And I was like, that sounds like my personal hell. Um, I am one of those people who needs to be doing something at all times. Like, 
even if I'm like relaxing, I can't, I don't watch a TV show. Like I cannot do it. I don't have the attention span. I will be like playing a game on my phone or like watching a YouTube video during all the commercials. Like I can't sit still and I genuinely enjoy being busy and having things to do that I think I would go batshit crazy if I ret- if I retired in my like 20s or my 30s because I cannot imagine myself doing nothing. I mean, I'd love to be work optional, right? I would love to be at a point where I'm like, well, I don't have to take on any work if I don't want to. But the reality of doing nothing, like that sounds horrible to me. So there's no point for me to invest as if I'm going to retire in my 30s because I'm not, I don't want to, I want to retire when I'm 65, you know, I I want a traditional, somewhat traditional retirement, you know? And I think, um, I think, yeah, it just goes back to figuring out like, what are your desires with your life and your money? And like, truly like get real with yourself about what that looks like, because it did take me a while actually to admit that I didn't want that. And I just was looking at other people living this lifestyle and thinking it was going to be so magical and like yeah it'd be so cool to you know see all my peers still working and know that I retired in my 30s then I was like Grace who the frick cares like nobody from high school is looking at you and being like oh my god she's so cool she retired in her 30s like literally nobody gives a shit it's about you and like what you want at the end of the day I feel like people don't like hear me out I feel like it's a myth and I'm not saying like numbers wise it's a myth obviously I understand the math I think it's a myth because like you don't retire and just sit there. You just don't. I don't know like no. really anyone that is one ambitious enough to save and invest enough to be able to retire in their like 30s or 40s, but then can like flip that switch and then just sit there for the rest of their life. It like literally doesn't happen. I think no. at that point you become so good at like making money or you just like would not be able to sit there and do nothing for what you just said, like insanity purposes. Yeah. Um, you don't stop making money. So I feel like that was like kind of a big realization for me this year too. I this year ramped up a lot of like my brokerage account investing, which for anyone listening to this, if you don't know what a brokerage account is, essentially it's just like a regular investing account, like not a retirement account has no tax advantages to it. Really. It's just a regular investment account. Um, and prior to this, I had my brokerage account open, but I only had like a thousand dollars or something in it. I really wasn't prioritizing it per se, but just this year, I was like, okay, I kind of had that same realization. I'm, I am contributing to my retirement accounts, but that's not my only goal. And like me thinking outwards to retirement is not the only thing that I want to accomplish in my life. Like you just said, like the work optional thing. I do think I want to get to a point where like, if I want to take a year off to either travel, write a book, do a startup, like something where I like need to remove myself from earning income for a year or two years or whatever. I want to have that safety net. So like, that's kind of a priority for me right now as well, which like I will get there through non-retirement investing. I think what you were saying when you were talking about, you know, this whole idea of work optional in like, or retiring in your thirties being kind of a bit of a myth. I was thinking about this. Everyone I know that has said they retired in their thirties is now just simply doing something else. <laughs> like I've seen, especially on social media, a lot of people are like, oh, I retired in my 30s. Now they're a social media content creator. They're selling courses. They're selling, you know, I don't know, coaching. They're making brand deal income. They're starting podcasts. They're doing speaking events. Like all they did was just transition from one work to the other. That's really all they did. And I think as entrepreneurs, because we both work for ourselves, it's a little different. I could see maybe if I worked a nine to five where I hated it. So I focused on working my way up for 10 years, making as much as I can, living frugally, investing so that I can stop working a nine to five in my thirties. You know, if I, again, if I had a job, I hated, I think being 24 and having a job I absolutely love, I don't feel that urgency to like let go of it because I genuinely enjoy working, which is I don't know, again, such a privilege, but such a cool thing to say. But I do think if I had maybe a nine to five, I'd be like, get me out of here. And I would, you know, be wanting to retire in my thirties. But I, I, everyone I know that has quote unquote retired in their thirties is just doing something else. Now that we've like established that we don't need to pour every extra dollar that we have (laughs) into investment accounts or retirement accounts, um, let's pivot a little bit to balancing, like obviously those financial goals, experiencing life and like having fun specifically in your twenties, because this is something that you and I obviously both talk about a lot. How do you sort of balance that? Like, how do you think of your priorities? How do you determine if a purchase is a good purchase in terms of experiencing life in your twenties versus like impulsive spending kind of talk through that? 
I think for me, one thing that was, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind that was really helpful for me was to know my numbers. So having a budget in place was an absolute game changer. I know both of us talk about budgeting on our pages all the time, and it probably sounds so overkill, but it truly is like so freeing when you can see your numbers and know your numbers. But I also think for me, knowing my numbers in terms of my debt, so I did what I call a debt audit where I listed everything out in one place. And I was like, okay, here's all my debt. I only had student loans, never had any type of other debt, but I listed them all out and I asked, I literally did the math and I was like, okay, if I only paid the minimum payment on this for the entire loan term, how much extra would I be paying in interest? And my debt was so low interest that if I paid the minimum payment for like 10 years, I was only going to pay an extra like I mean, it was like five to $10,000. And in my mind, over the course of 10 years, that was not bad. And I was already paying more than the minimum payment. So I knew, okay, I do not need to go absolutely ham on paying this off. I can have more balance. And I think the other thing that helped me was kind of going back to what I said earlier, is getting real about what genuinely mattered to me. I asked myself, if I put every extra dollar onto my debt, or you know, if I didn't give myself as much wiggle room to live my life, and I put more of my money towards my more quote unquote, practical financial goals, will I look back in five years and feel like I missed out? And for me, the answer was yes. I was like, I, when I was establishing all these goals, I think I was like 22, 23. I was like, I don't want to be 27, 28 and say, crap, I, you know, all my friends have traveled these years. You know, I'm at a point now where maybe I want to settle into one city and not be traveling all the time. I don't want to look back have those feelings and be like, crap, I wish I did something with my 20s. Because reality is me paying off my debt two years early, five years early, however many years early, great. You don't get an award. Um, you're the only one that, you know, saving yourself interest is obviously great, but like there's no, it's not a competition. So you have to generally think about what's going to make you happy. And I knew that for me, having more balance made me happy. So I I have a hard time actually like justifying expenses that are solely for myself. And this is funny because I just had a therapy appointment yesterday where my therapist, like my task for this week, she gives me like something to do every week. My task is to actually go into my budget and create a like a specific budget line for self-care for myself. So I'm being forced now. Um, but I think I've, I've genuinely had to force myself to give myself more space in my budget to just like live my life. For example, this month I went to a fair at the beginning of the month. I'm going to see Polly D um, <laughs> at the club. I don't know. My friend loves Jersey Shore and he was like, do you want to go? And I was like, I won't say no, you know, I want to live my life. So I have, you know, given myself more wiggle room this month to pay for the hotel when we're at the club and, um, you know, stuff like that. And I don't know, just like forcing myself to give myself a budget for that and know that it's okay. But I also know that it's okay to do that because I know that I'm contributing enough every month to retire when I want to. And with enough money, I am contributing enough to my debt that I feel comfortable with it. You know, again, I'm not going balls to the walls, throwing every extra dollar onto my debt, but I like where I'm at. I feel comfortable with it. I feel like I'm on track to my savings goals because I know all those numbers so I can justify spending more on living my life because again, I think I know I know where I'm at with my other goals. There's so much good stuff there that I want to unpack first. You were talking about the like, debt situation. Like, will you be happier four years from now if you paid off your debt two years early or whatever? And for you, it's no. I go so back and forth with this. And I think like that alone is a really good money less. It's okay if your priorities change. Like obviously we're in our early twenties. I'm so indecisive. I change my mind all the time. So it's okay if like your priorities are changing relatively frequently. I think like between investing versus saving versus paying down debt, as long as you're like putting your extra money to a financial goal, that's fine. <laughs> your priorities are allowed to change. But I think for me, um, why I've been so, I just made a video, I think like a week ago or something that was saying that I want to prioritize paying off my car loan, which my car loan only has like $6,000 left on it. And before the last month, that was not a high priority for me at all. I think the interest rate is only like three-ish, three and a half percent. Um, so it wasn't a high priority for me because obviously like optimizing your return and like everything says that I like shouldn't prioritize paying off this loan. However, um, I think the whole being debt free for me thing is 
in my mind, it like gives me more options. Um, for example, earlier this year, I took the leap from quitting my corporate job to like joining a startup full time to transitioning into like being completely self-employed and strictly freelancing. And a big reason why I felt comfortable doing that was because I knew that I was going to be able to pay off my $40,000 worth of student loans this year. And if I was in a situation where I was like, I had a ton of debt and I like wasn't able to pay it off, I think that I would have like rethought that. And it turns out that quitting my corporate job was absolutely the right move for me. Like I make so much more money now than I did in my corporate salary. And if I didn't take that leap, I wouldn't have really had that opportunity. So I think for me, I know that once I'm debt free, I will like feel like my options are greater, even if that's not materially the case. And even if like the numbers don't support that, sometimes you just really have to do what's best in your mind and like what makes you feel the most comfortable. I was talking with somebody actually recently. I don't remember where, I don't know if it was like a post I saw online or something, but we were kind of talking about this idea of optimizing for speed and optimizing for growth. And I think there's a lot of pressure in the financial space to optimize for speed and growth. Like, how can I retire the fastest? How can I get out of debt the fastest? How can I grow my investments the fastest? How can I grow my income the fastest and whatever? But you don't have to optimize for speed or growth. You're not obligated to. Like I said, with my debt, my debt is so low interest. I only have federal student loans now. And for example, I'm planning on moving out of my parents' house soon. And I knew, okay, I want to have money saved because I'm going to have to pay for, you know, to ship my car somewhere because I'm probably not going to be moving locally. Like there's a lot of expenses that are going to come with that. So for me, I was like, okay, do I want to try to pay off my debt as fast as possible and optimize for speed there? Or do I want to take a more balanced approach where I'm contributing to my moving savings and I'm contributing to paying off my debt so that I can still move out in six months or so, however long it's going to take me and pay off my debt. And for me, it was like, okay, I can do both simultaneously. Um, you know, yes, I could focus on just one at a time where I'm like, okay, I'm only going to focus on my debt or I can take that balanced approach where I focus on both things. You don't have to invest every dollar to grow it as fast as you can. If you also want to have the flexibility to like have a larger emergency savings and be able to quit your corporate job and take some time off work or whatever it is. Um, yeah, you don't have to optimize for speed and growth constantly, yeah. especially when you're in your twenties, like, God, we're just so young. <laughs> you're not retired yeah, tomorrow. Are we <laughs> like you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. If like your investment yeah. account is not like absolutely <laughs> popping right now, you know what I mean? Like you will be good. Your world's yeah. not going to crumble when you're 25 and you know, like it's okay. Yes. I know. We were having this conversation, um, the other day too, about like our businesses, the business emergency fund thing and all of that. And I think the whole not throwing every dollar into your investments kind of goes towards that as well. Um, one thing that I was saying to you was I think next year, like I'm going to have a lot of business expenses. I want to like reinvest some of the money that I've been making into my business. I want to hire a business coach. Like I want to have the flexibility of a large chunk in my business account to be able to like take advantage of opportunities that come up. And I don't even know what those look like. I don't have like set defined goals yet and know exactly how I'm going to allocate every dollar that's sitting in there. But I don't really want to like pull out thousands and thousands of dollars out of my business account to invest it, to optimize my return. And then six months from now, have an opportunity and be like, I don't have enough in my business checking to like support that. Um, because obviously with self-employment, you don't know how much you're going to make every month. It could be a lot. It could be nothing. <laughs> you yeah. have really no idea. Um, so I think that like goes back to that aspect as well. Like sometimes not optimizing for like speed and growth on the investment side can in turn allow you to grow a lot faster if you have a business or self-employed are going to make some of those investments into yourself. Yeah. This reminds me of the like hierarchy of goals you had kind of talked about or of like your finances because that's how I kind of think of it too. But in terms of the like hierarchy of your needs, which I know that's like a psychological term, but I'm not talking about the psychological term. I'm talking about how, like, what is genuinely important to you in this phase of your life and what's going to help you get. Yeah. Can you talk more about like the hierarchy? Because I feel like I remember seeing your post about that and I thought it was really well put together and very smart. I'll link the, either like the video in the show notes, or maybe I'll link like just the specific 
I guess I can't do a PDF. I don't know. I'll link <laughs> something that refers to this hierarchy if you're curious. Um, but yes, a couple of weeks ago, I put a video up that was talking about like the way that I think through prioritizing your financial goals and just like the hierarchy of needs that Grace was just talking about. Essentially, this hierarchy of financial goals had three different tiers and the bottom tier was some of your like basic financial goals. So starting your emergency fund in this tier, I said starting with a thousand dollars, but ideally up to three to six months worth of expenses, whatever you feel comfortable with, whatever you feel secure with. Um, the second thing was either staying out of credit card debt or getting yourself out of credit card debt. So for me, I've never, I've like thankfully never been in credit card debt. So for me, that's staying out of credit card debt in this tier or getting out of it if um, you are in that situation. And then the third thing in this tier on the investment side was really just like starting to invest for retirement. So investing like up to the employer match in your 401k, or if you don't have access to a 401k and something like an IRA or something like that. So that was like the first tier. And then as you go up the hierarchy, you like essentially get more options. And in each tier, there was one thing related to saving investing and debt pay down. Um, and I think like the hierarchy did a good job of like bucketing them together and allowing you to see you can do a mix of all three because like one question that we get asked all the time is, okay, should I be saving or should I be investing or should I be paying down debt? And like we've been alluding to for the last 20 minutes, like you're probably going to be doing a mix of all three simultaneously for the rest of your life. But there is a way to kind of like group them together and see like, okay, if I still have one thing left to do in this first tier, then I shouldn't move on to the second tier until I kind of like take care of that. Like I wouldn't start increasing my 401k contributions past the match if I'm, let's say, still in credit card debt or if I haven't built up my emergency fund yet and like so on and so forth. I think there are smart ways to go about that. And that's why I really liked that hierarchy that you did. It was a great visual. We'll definitely link it in the show notes, but it was just a nice way to see what makes sense because again like we were saying we both are big believers that you should emergency fund is like the first thing that you should be doing and then yeah once you get that out of the way okay now you have a little bit more choice like focus on your high interest debt you know but also start maybe thinking about investing and you know kind of moving through that um but there are some kind of i don't want to say non-negotiables because i guess it's not fully non-negotiable um you 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 can do obviously whatever you want. If you're free, you have free will, but you know, there are probably some smarter ways you can go about doing it. This also reminded me about how some expenses, and we say this all the time when we talk about stuff, um, just like personally, some expenses are almost, I don't want to say investments in yourself, but kind of, I know we've talked about how you know, I wanted to live alone and I was like, oh my gosh, especially in Boston, the apartments are insanely priced. But one thing I know you had talked to me about when we saw each other in July, you were like paying rent to live by yourself is an investment in yourself. And especially as a business owner, you'll see a return on that investment just from like the way you feel and being more like creative and more present. Um, which I think is like, I don't know, a really smart way to look at some of the expenses you make. Like, yeah, you're not maybe getting investment returns on it in the traditional sense, but you're getting a return from like the happiness that you have in your life. I actually had it in my notes here that I wanted to talk about like how to balance like specifically within your budget in general. And we got a couple of listener questions about this as well. How to balance like your percentages, I guess, between your needs and your wants, all of that. And I think the rent cost plays a huge factor in this, obviously, because your rent for a lot of people is like the biggest line item in your budget by far. And yes, I do think that there's a balance between, you obviously don't want your rent to take up your entire budget. You want to still have room to go out to eat or go on vacation or buy clothes and everything like that. But at the same time, how big of a priority is your rent? Because for me, like you just said, Grace, within the last year, I've noticed how important my space is. Maybe this is just a result of working from home and owning my own business. Um, I need a space that works for me and I feel comfortable in and allows me to feel productive. So I'm actually moving. I think I'm moving within the next like two months and my rent is going to go up like $500 because I'm getting a second bedroom strictly for an office, which is going to be literally the biggest game changer. And in my head, I'm like, 
oh my gosh, that's $500 less that I'm going to have to like go out to eat and like do all of these things. But on the other hand, I, and I just made a video about this and so many people related on the other hand, it's like that $500 is going to be so worth the mental health aspect of it. Like I'm going to feel so much better, so much more productive when I have a space that is solely for my work. I think that goes back to knowing what you value genuinely, because some people, I had a friend who their roommate used to work at their like bar in their kitchen, like at the island. And that was fine for him. He liked standing up all day and working at the bar and that was fine. That would drive me nuts. So like knowing what you value and what genuinely makes sense to you is so important. And this also reminds me about paying for convenience, which is like a conversation a lot of people get into as well. Like if you are somebody who like, I don't know, one thing I hate is like, cleaning my car i just like i i don't know what it is something about going to the car wash like freaks me out <laughs> i don't i don't like driving through i feel like i'm gonna get stuck in the car wash um so i will pay for somebody to like detail my car and that is a worthwhile spend to me because it gives me my time back and i don't have to put myself in the car wash i don't know maybe some people listening to this will relate but there's something about having to drive through those car washes where you're like boxed in it i can't do it it like really freaks me out um but like when it's, you know, I live in, in Massachusetts, so it's like when it's the winter, I'm not going to get my hose out and like go clean my car on my icy driveway. I'm just going to take it for somebody else to kind of take care of. But I think when this kind of goes into one of the other things you want to talk about is having a budget for things like that, giving yourself, and I know we both actually do this. So I have a sinking fund for self-care, which if you're not familiar with what a sinking fund is, it's basically just... A little separate savings account or I mean you could put it in the same savings account but I know we kind of have separate ones or I use Ally Bank where there's little buckets so I can kind of you know put money into one bucket versus the other and it's just a fund you basically contribute a little bit to on a certain frequency so I do every month you could do every week every time you get paid whatever that looks like and that's so helpful for me because that helps me justify some of those fun expenses when I'm like okay I want to go get my Botox topped up I'm like, great, I have the $600 or whatever sitting in my self-care sinking fund that I've been contributing to every month. I feel okay to go do that. And I know you've done the same with some of the like purchases you've made. I think you did a video about this recently too. Yeah, mine's called fun money, <laughs> but it's essentially the same thing. I feel like I listed it as fun money because that gives me a lot of options, whether it's like, okay, I, I mean, I have a vacation sinking fund, but if I want that to go towards a vacation, whatever, if I want it to go towards shopping, whatever, if I want it, like I really have the flexibility to kind of use it in whatever way I want to. Some things that I've used my fun money sinking fund for this year have been like getting my eyebrows microbladed. That was like $900. I bought an expensive piece of jewelry. Um, so not like day to day items, but like larger purchases. I'm going to look back at like the expensive piece of jewelry that I bought. And I know that I never have to feel guilty about that because I saved for it and used a savings account to like pay for it. And I think that helps you kind of follow through, or at least it's helped me follow through on the balance portion of things. Because when I was just pulling money from my budget every month, it was hard for me to justify because I'd be like, oh crap, like, you know, I want to go do this and I get Botox in my jaw for context because I have like TMJ I clench my jaw really hard and so you know it was something that I didn't do for so long because it is expensive but I also you know my freaking jaw would hurt so bad so I'm like okay I need to do this and so having that money set aside helps me justify that and helps me be like okay this is money that I've set aside after I have hit my minimum that I want to hit for investing after I've hit my minimum for debt that I want to hit after I've paid my rent and done my necessary expenses, like this is leftover money that I have set aside for this exact purpose. I wouldn't be doing right by myself if I went and spent it on something different, you know, like unless I had a crisis, right? If I had a crisis and an emergency and I need to pull for my, you know, fun money sinking fund, that's fine. But it's there for a reason. Like you set it aside for yourself. So follow through and use it on those things to live your life like you initially intended to use it for. Uh, when you said that about the TMJ, that reminded me, your therapist is really onto something with the self-care line, which sounds so intuitive. Like, yes, you like need some self-care, right? My thing is massages. I don't know why I cannot justify getting a massage. They're so expensive. 
but I've been having the worst back pain for like a year. Like I, mm -hmm. it like keeps me up at night sometimes. Like my quality of life is so diminished because I'm so stubborn to go get a massage and I know how stupid that sounds. That's something that I really need to do too is just like set $200 aside for self-care, use it for things like massages, chiropractors. I went through the same thing actually with massages specifically, which is funny that you say that because ever since I, when I started working at home, I was working at my dining room table because I didn't have any sort of office and I, w I didn't have my laptop raised. It was just sitting down on the table. So I was like the hunchback of Notre Dame every day looking down at my laptop and I ended up getting the worst neck and back pain to the point where I remember it was so bad. One night, it was getting progressively worse over and over. And one night I went to bed and when I woke up the next morning, I like, it was so painful. I couldn't even like lift my head up. <laughs> I literally had to put my arm down and like push my body over. And I was like, this is ridiculous. I'm like <laughs> around me. Cause I live in kind of like the middle of nowhere. A massage is like $75. I was like, Grace, you would not even think twice about spending $75 on somebody else. But here you are in so much pain because you've put <laughs> off getting a massage for six plus months that now you have to like hoist yourself out of your bed. This is, this is no, this is ridiculous. It's, it's so funny. And the reason my therapist told me I need to do this is because we were talking about how I'm in a place now financially where I have more wiggle room. I can afford to spend a little bit more on myself. Um, and I was talking about how I recently, I have the hardest time finding jeans. And I know we talked about this because you gave me some recommendations, but for some reason, I just, I cannot find jeans I like. And this year I've been healing my gut after I found out I had a gluten allergy. Because of that, I've been going through, like my body like fluctuates a lot. So I'd be super bloated one day. And then the next day I look skinty as hell. And it just kind of would go back and forth. And that's obviously really hard to find clothes that fit you when you're fluctuating up and down multiple sizes. But my body's finally leveled out and is, you know, really close to fully healed, I would say. And I'm like, okay, now I want to get some jeans that genuinely fit me. And I told my therapist, I was like, I went to the mall and I spent a good chunk of money on some high quality jeans I really love. They were like $150 to $250 per pair, which is that's crazy to me because I was buying like old navy before that were like $30, $40. <laughs> so it, it really took a lot of focus to be like, I'm going to spend this money on myself. And I said to her, I was like, you know, I realized when I went and bought those jeans, I don't do a lot of that type of stuff for myself. I said to her, I was like, I've put off getting my hair done until it looks scraggly as hell. And I'm like, this is embarrassing. I've got to get back to the salon rather than just paying to keep up with it. I get my nails done and I will let them grow out for like four weeks until again, they're like hanging on by a thread. And then I'm like, yeah, I'll go get them done. I'm like, I'm at a point financially where I can't afford to go get my hair done and not look scraggly in between. I can't afford to get my nails done before they look nasty. Like, why am I not doing that? And she kind of, we were talking about having this guilt that comes with spending money on yourself and having more balance. And, you know, again, being in the personal finance space, I think sometimes I do feel guilt of like, I, I should be making all these practical decisions and teaching people to make practical decisions. But there also has to be an element of just doing things like, again, just to live your life. And so I had told her, I said, I said, you know, I started looking at my budget and this month I set aside $250 for dating because I've been seeing someone recently and we've been going on lots of dates and I don't want him to feel like he has to pay for every single date. And, you know, there's dates I want to plan and things that I think if I'm planning it, I should pay for it. And I said to her, I'm like, I set aside $250 easily, no questions asked for dating. And I said, we went on a date the other week. I spent like $117 in one night. But if I had to set that aside for myself, I'm going to sit there and question it so hard. So she was like, okay, well, then your task this week is to do exactly that. And I was like, girl, I just told you that's going to be so hard. Like, don't make me do this. But it is such a good thing to come back to, to be like, okay, you'll very easily look at some extra cash and maybe, you know, put it towards somebody else, put it towards buying a gift for somebody or, you know, put it towards your debt, put it towards investing, whatever it is. But are you able to give that back to yourself because, or to something that you want? Again, like buying an expensive piece of jewelry, it's not something that's like, it's not the most quote unquote practical decision, right? Like, you know what I mean? It's it's not a need, but it was a want and it was meaningful to you. And didn't you get it in celebration of like 
leaving your job or something like that too. Yeah. Like there was, I like yeah. only buy designer or it wasn't even, but like ex- more expensive things like that, like a designer bag or whatever. When I hit like a milestone, so right. I bought my one and only designer bag when I finished my MBA. And then I bought this like expensive piece of jewelry um, when I quit my corporate job to join the startup full time. So funny that you said like the hair appointments and the nails, like looking <laughs> straggly in, be- in between because I literally like need a hair appointment. I'm a blonde, but like I get, it's because I get highlights and my roots grow in so dark because I'm Italian. Like I should be getting a hair, my hair done this month, but I'm literally pushing it off to November because then I don't have to put it into my October budget. Mm -hmm. And like, that's so annoying of me. I think you mentioned like being in the personal finance space too. I do think being so transparent with your money is kind of like a double-edged sword too and definitely plays into like some of the anxiety because when you're transparent about it, obviously you get like backlash for the decisions that you make. Sometimes like people don't have a lot of contacts, like you don't include your income in every one of your videos so it's like you are supposedly talking about personal finance and then you're sitting here talking about spending a bunch of money on jeans or getting your hair done or going on vacation and like kind of the repercussions of that like I literally don't even read my comments on those what I spend in a week videos because they're they're a lot most of the time I think there's a lot of I don't want to say judgment, but kind of when you're looking at someone else's situation. And I know this has come up with my friends a lot where someone says, oh, I can't, you know, like, for example, um, somebody was like, oh, we're going to go on a vacation, like some sort of trip. And someone I knew was like, oh, well, you know, I don't, someone told me that it's not in their budget and they can't go. But then I saw them going on another vacation with somebody else. So I'm like, okay, what do you mean that this trip isn't in your budget? And it goes back to what you define as important to you, what's valuable to you and what balance looks like to you. You know, for me, I'm not the type of person who's going to go on like 10 different vacations or is going to go on a girl's trip just because there's a girl's trip being planned. If I don't want to go or if it doesn't really align with my financial goals at the time, I'm I'm not going to go. I'm so sorry. You know, but I think that there is like when you're looking at somebody else's finances objectively, it's so hard to know what actually is going on behind the scenes. Like, yeah, I spent $650 on jeans in one day and that's crazy. Even, even though I can afford it, right. I was like, Oh my God, like handing my card over. But also I don't, I'm not the person who like goes and like goes to the bar every single weekend because that's not something I personally value. But when you look at it objectively, you're like, this girl must be batshit crazy if she's like spending $650 on jeans and think that's okay, you know? But it's like, that's part of my balance. That's what I like, you know? I'm I'm making decisions about my money that are different from other people so that it reflects, so I can spend money on like what I want to. I love this concept so much. I was just talking about this in a video the other day about like the concept of saying no to things to be able to say yes guilt-free that's the balance there is you're going to be invited to a ton of things from a ton of different people in your 20s and feeling okay and feeling confident enough to say no when you actually don't want to be doing the things that don't serve you gives you so much more room in your budget to say yes when there is something that you actually do want to be at and that's something that takes a long time to learn and even once you do learn it you still catch yourself being like oh my gosh why did I say yes to this I'm spending so much money and I like didn't I knew that I didn't want to do it the vacation example was a really good one and I feel like we could go through I think we should do an entire episode on like our different save versus splurges I think that would be a really fun episode because you and I like have some similarities but also some differences when it comes to like what we like to spend our money on so I think that would be a really fun episode but should we end with like a couple of listener questions this is kind of how we're planning on ending all of our episodes moving forward. So if you guys ever have anything that you want us to cover in this little segment of the podcast, definitely feel free to send us a message or we'll probably do some like question stickers on our Instagram and things like that. Yeah. I was just going to say, I feel like this is a perfect way to kind of go into the listener question. One, I think is interesting to ask you because you're, I guess, kind of somewhat new to this since you, now your income, you're 100% self-employed, but how do you manage inconsistent income? I think it's just about honestly giving yourself a good enough buffer to like feel secure with it. Knowing that there's the possibility that you're going to have some slow months. This just happened to me. I had like a huge high month and I was like so excited but I take out the exact same amount every single month out of my business account into my personal account. Um, And even when I made like significantly more than that, I still only withdrew the exact same amount because literally the next month I don't, I'm a third of what I pull out of my 
business account every month. So it was like, sometimes there's really high highs. Sometimes there's low lows. Hopefully the highs outweigh the lows, but just being able to like kind of not restrict yourself, but just like hold yourself to your regular base. I'm kind of thinking it as like a salary. Like I pay myself a salary. I actually legit do pay my salary myself a salary because of how my business is structured but um just like not getting caught up in the like oh well I made a lot of money this month so I can afford it kind of thing um just like holding yourself to that I've been fully self-employed for a little over two years and so this is something I've been dealing with for quite a long time and I think what's helped me is have that emergency fund like when you start making money make that emergency fund your top priority because since I have that I'm not really quote unquote afraid of having an, a low month because I know that if I do dip below the amount that I need to sustain myself, I have a backup. It's okay. And I've never had to dip into my emergency fund, luckily, but that gives me a lot of peace of mind around it. The second thing I would say is know what your minimum is. So know like what are my absolute necessary expenses and what is that amount that I need to make sure I have and prioritize those things in your budget. So know that you have enough to cover your rent before you're you know going out and spending a bunch of money with your friends. And one thing too that has helped me, and it's a little tricky because I, I don't quite remember how I started doing this, but I budget one month ahead. So, and this has been a game changer for me. So anything that I made in, in September is the money that I get to use in October. And now that I'm, you know, same situation with your business, I've set myself up on payroll. I have a salary now. It doesn't like quite check out that same way, but my distributions, I think of it that way. So I'm like, okay, I made you know, X amount in September, that's what I use to inform my spending in October. And that gives me peace of mind that I'm not waiting for a paycheck to come in to be able to pay that bill. I'm basing my spending off of what I made last month. So I'll take what I made and then I'll, you know, say, okay, well, I have $5,000 to work with or whatever, just to have an easy number. I'll take out all of my needs. Okay. Pulling my bills out of this and pulling my investment contributions out of the amount, what's left over. And I'll give myself a certain amount of that leftover for fun. And then I'll keep a little bit of a buffer just in case shit hits the fan throughout the month and something unexpected shows up. But that way I'm, I'm not worried about like, oh crap, I haven't made as much as I thought I was going to in the first two weeks of October. I can't pay my bill midway through the month. Um, you definitely do have to be strategic if you have inconsistent income, but I think it's really manageable. Once you get a hang of it, it, it definitely, you kind of get into a flow and it becomes a lot more manageable. This is kind of funny. We got a question that says, thoughts on the personal finance space being kind of scammy. What are your thoughts, feelings, questions so, about that, Grace? I also thought this was an interesting question. I think one thing I'll say, and this is like my first thought when I saw this question was, I think it depends on like what side of the personal finance space I think you're on, right? And I also think that, there are a lot of personal finance creators, a lot of personal finance content out there, a lot of personal finance books and podcasts that they're not scammy, but I think people assume they're scammy because I don't want to say of a lack of knowledge, but because that sounds, that's harsh. And I don't think that's, that's not quite what I mean, but you know, there are people, for example, who talk about real estate investing and they talk about how they have achieved financial freedom. They make all their money from real estate investing. And because it doesn't seem believable to people, they automatically feel like it's fake. There's that, you know, social media page, Salary Transparent Street. There's one called American Income where they interview people and have them share their salaries. And I can't even tell you like the comments. If someone makes like over 80,000 people are commenting being like, this is cap, that's fake. There's no way. And it's like, just because you have not seen that before does not mean that this person's a scammer and that they're making money in some sketchy way. It's just different than what you've heard, you know? And I think defaulting to automatically assuming that whatever you see as a scam is a defense mechanism. And I would encourage people to kind of open up their minds. Um, but in terms of like content that's clearly, you know, some of the affiliate marketing stuff or some of the, you know, MLM stuff like that, yeah, there's going to be accounts out there that are like, I've reached financial freedom or I've made $100,000 in the past week. Like, you know, I've retired my husband, all these things because they're in an MLM and they're part of the very, very small percentage of MLM people that, you know, it actually works for. But I would say like, use your own, you know, your intuition. And like, I don't know, I feel like, especially if you're listening to this podcast, you're smart enough to discern you know, what is and isn't a scam if you're actively learning about money. Um, so yeah, proceed with caution, but also keep an open mind when you hear about ways people are making money because 
it could be something that you just truly don't know anything about yet. Yes, 100% about the like different ways to make money thing. Don't automatically assume that it doesn't work, it's a scam, or it can't be applied to you. The other thing that I will say on this is like before you decide whether something is like quote unquote a scam, just kind of understand what the person is selling. Because if someone's like talking about their financial situation and you like go to their profile and they're not selling a $500 course or they're not selling you anything, it's like, what does that person have to gain from like lying about anything? For example, I don't, not, neither of us sell like financial courses or whatever. Mm -hmm. And we just kind of talk about like our own personal financial situation. That's sort of how we like educate is through like our own scenarios. And then through that, people can either be inspired or they can like take that and apply it to their own financial situation. But if you see someone that's talking about like, oh, I made a million dollars in a year and you go and they are trying to sell you a $500 course, like then proceed with like a little bit of caution there and kind of say, okay, yes, maybe this course can be helpful for me. Let's say it's in like the financial education space, but did I exhaust all of my other free or low cost options for learning that same topic? For example, if you're trying to learn about money, did I read all of these great books that are like $10 a piece? Or did I listen to podcasts like these that are going to like educate me in under an hour? Do I really need that $500 course? Or like, did I already exhaust, exhaust all of my other options? And now I want to like kind of take it a step further. There are so many free and low cost options that, I mean, we can honestly even do a whole episode about all that stuff because there is just so much out there. I've never taken a course on personal finance. So I've learned everything from just Googling and reading books and listening to podcasts. Yeah. Do you want to do the last question? It's so broad. I feel like we could almost make a yeah. whole episode out of it. So this one says tips on starting your financial journey. I do have one thought here. We won't spend too much time of it on it because we are literally so far over time, um, but that's okay. Hopefully you guys are still listening a lot. So tips on starting your financial journey. I will say like when you feel like you are totally clueless about your money, and we've talked about this in some videos we've made in the past differentiate the financial literacy piece from the being good with your money piece because I think oftentimes people like combine the two. I made a video a couple weeks ago that was saying that learning about money and like becoming financially literate is really only 20% about skill and knowledge and learning the concepts and the other 80% the good with your money piece is all about financial discipline. Are you spending the money in the way that you intended to when you created your budget? Are you not spending impulsively? Are you actually setting aside money every month? Are you actually physically transferring the money to your investments? Like those things are all about being good with your money that don't take any skill and knowledge. And you definitely do need both. Like it has to be a mix of both. But I would say like, if you were just starting on your financial literacy journey, like only spend 20% of your time really learning the skills and the knowledge and literally do that by picking up one money book and you'll probably learn most of what you need to know and then spend 80% of your efforts on that discipline, discipline piece. I think focus on, it is really about so much, so little about, you know, the skill and learning all the details um, and more about taking action. And you also can like figure things out as you go. You do not need to be a pro. It does not have to go seamlessly the first time you try to budget or, you know, it's okay to have questions along the way. Like, you can go open an investment account and just like not and put a dollar in it and just be like, okay, I got through opening the account. I'm just going to sit right here now. and I'm going to read a few more things about how to actually invest or what I should invest in, things like that. You can take it one step at a time and that's fine. Again, you don't have to optimize for speed and go from zero to a hundred in the span of a week. You can kind of take a bit of a slow burn when you kind of start your financial journey. Well, I think that's all we have. I think this is the end of our very, very first episode of the Girls Talk Money podcast. So we're really excited. We went over an hour. All of our episodes probably will not be this long, obviously, depending on the topic. Um, but we're really excited. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. And until next week.